Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's so good to see everyone and good to see the Mosaic folks here. I was talking to them before and Kim Letty was like, I never see you awake this early. <laughs> I was like, damn, what has my reputation become? <laughs> Though I suppose uh, if you ask people who knew me when I was younger, my reputation has become, has come full circle. Um, I am sometimes up this early, though not this present in front of people. So uh, if I am kind of slowed for my brain to turn on, give me a second. Um, I am excited. Wait, is this my countdown clock? <laughs> that is daunting. Um, OK. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a Mission Impossible movie. <laughs> um, the, the big, a big thing that I want to talk about today is not only, um, I want to talk about the telling of stories, not only these stories that get told, but how stories get told and kind of reverse engineering a storytelling that works to tell a story for you. And there are two different threads I'm going to go on. One is the first and foremost, the most important one is I grew up in the oral tradition. And I think particularly for black folks, uh, American black folks who grew up in an oral tradition, you know this thing where an elder perhaps has maybe three stories, but they tell them in infinite ways, right? I have heard my father tell the wide variation of the same kind of five stories, but you can affix a certain moral to one. You can affix a, an entry point, an exit point, an image that makes it feel like a new story every time. This was vital for me to understand the role of storytelling and writing and the role of entry points and exit points and how to get to the heart of something I want to say. Two is that it is, um, I'm trying to find a gentle word. It is fascinating at times to um, live in a city, which I love. I love Columbus. It's not breaking news. Um, but it is fascinating to live in a city that doesn't seem to have an understanding of the story that it wants to tell about itself and who it wants to tell that story at the expense of. So when we think about Columbus broadly or what Columbus sells itself to be to the nation, at least, um, what I often see is a place, a geographical place and people within it that are conflicted about where they live. When you see a certain story or you hear a certain story about where you're from or what it's like where you're from and it doesn't mirror your experience, then you begin to doubt where you're from. You begin to doubt your actual location or what makes your location valuable or special and all that. I grew up on the east side of Columbus. Um, yeah. Yes. Shout out to one of you, I suppose. <laughs> um, and, and I also live now on the east side of Columbus. And um, particularly in the neighborhood I live now, it is interesting because uh, as you drive into it, you can see the kind of fracturing and rebuilding of it, right? If I'm driving down Long Street, I see the, the like one millionth high rise condo with a restaurant underneath it and all this shit. And then you kind of cross over to a border and it becomes a neighborhood that I know. Right. And so how does one preserve the story they know when a new story is being built atop it? Um, and to kind of get into the, the heart of uh, storytelling, I, I want to kind of reverse engineer something I did in Little Devil in America. Little Devil in America is a book that is... Um, a series of essays that are odes to black performance, various modes of black performance. And the central part of A Little Devil in America is that I took it, um, I don't know if anyone here has ever dealt with publishing or, or like book deals or whatever, but whenever Justin Timberlake was making, this is like, I know we went far from where I began and now we're talking about Justin Timberlake, <laughs> but whenever Justin Timberlake was making that fucked up uh, Man of the Woods album, <laughs> I wrote this essay about the malleability of the, how, the, how the malleability of the white pop star can sell itself. And I wrote about Memphis and Al Green and Justin Timberlake and, and Elvis and Isaac Hayes. Um, and I went 
you know, in 2018, I went to the office of a random house and they were like, what do you, the editor was like, what are you working on? And I was like, well, I just wrote this essay and he read it and he was like, cool, cool, cool. That looks great. And I say, okay. And I went to the elevator and I went downstairs and I looked at my phone and he was like, we want to make this a book. So can you write a book about the appropriation of black culture through from minstrelsy to present? And at the time I thought, yeah, I could do that, I think. And then I sat down to write the book and I thought, this isn't pleasurable to me, right? I'm a big, I'm a Toni Morrison disciple in a lot of ways. And one way that Toni Morrison suggested the black writer operate is to extract any kind of obsession or interest in whiteness as it impacts black greatness, right? And so I began to ask myself, what would happen if I extracted this idea of appropriation and began to write a story instead that does not at all threaten the brilliance of the people who are centering, who are, who are at the center of it. To get my brain to kind of twist in this direction, I had a friend of mine uh, send me a hard drive that consisted of every Soul Train episode from 1975 to 1989, right? The, the whole idea behind this was, I grew up, I think like a lot of folks maybe in this room who are in my generation or even older, I grew up watching Soul Train reruns on like WGN. You know, they play on Sundays. If you're, in, if you're in Ohio, you get WGN, they play them out of Chicago. They play Soul Train reruns. But the thing with playing Soul Train, I can't move this. <laughs> this is heavy as fuck, right? I didn't know. I'm sorry if I'm cursing too much. Um, <laughs> Now that that has moved, I feel like I will definitely become, with the hand talking, I'll become like an evangelical <laughs> pastor. Um, but the thing with Soul Train reruns is that you don't, if you are watching a Soul Train rerun in 1993, you're seeing commercials from 1993. So there's a rupture. You're not really immersed in the world. And so I had a homie who had every Soul Train episode. So I wanted to see I wanted to be immersed in the world. I wanted to see the like Johnson Products commercials, the infamous Frederick Douglass Afro Sheen commercial, all that type stuff. Um, if you haven't seen the Frederick Douglass Afro Sheen commercial, I, I would recommend. It's, it's on YouTube. It's very much on YouTube in many forms. Um, and so I watched hours and hours and hours and hours of Soul Train, literally hundreds of hours of Soul Train. And through that, something clicked. People like to believe that nonfiction or the essay is something that must be an argument. And certainly it can be an argument. You can present an argument, defend an argument. That is the form as it's, as it's currently presented. But speaking of evangelical forms, I thought, what if for the sake of this book, this time, I believe that the essay has already written itself and I therefore am just a vessel through which the good news travels? Right. And so there became this idea of if I am not going to create an argument through this process, I need to learn how to tell a story through this process. And I also knew that I wanted the first essay in the book to be about Soul Train. And I wrote this really long flowing thing about Soul Train lines and about Don Cornelius. And at the time, it was about how Whitney Houston could not dance very well. Um, and when I turned it in, the editor was kind of like, this is, there's a lot of beautiful language, but there's no, nothing is actually moving. Nothing's actually happening. Personally, when it comes to music, for those who know me, like I'm a big music person. Uh, I like a song that does nothing, right? I like a song that is a pop song specifically, that's like fun, but doesn't actually do anything like, um, Sheena Easton's nine to five, which essentially she's just like, my boyfriend has a job. That's the whole song. <laughs> I kind of like that, you know, but in, the, in this form, it wasn't working. And so I needed something to unlock the mode of storytelling. It couldn't just be about Soul Train. Around this time, someone was kind of like, have you ever heard of Alma Cummings? I said, no, of course. And I fell down this rabbit hole of Alma Cummings, who was in the very early, like right pre-depression era America, she was a woman who was a dancer who danced in a ballroom with various men for about 25 hours straight, right? 
at the time, this was this happened at a different, a unique time in American history. One, America was becoming increasingly obsessed with records and the setting of records, right? And so there was this records obsessed idea. Guinness was beginning to rise. The other thing is, it kind of hit this point of um, a woman doing this with dancing with a lot of men was seen as extra salacious. And so it caught the attention of a lot of people. This is a photo of Alma Cummings. I don't know if you can see very well, but I was, this photo is like really haunting to me because her eyes are like really dazed and her, her shoes have holes in where like where you're, where you would strike the ground or shoes, they like have two holes in them. Alma Cummings is important because she began what would become this obsession with the dance marathon. The Great Depression era dance marathons are like horrifying and terrible in a lot of ways because I, I don't know if anyone knows about these, but a homie of mine was doing an exhibit on these and I, he was like, you know, I read your Soul Train piece. I think you need to look at these dance marathon photos that I have. And I was like, no, 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 you know, this book got black performance and black people weren't dancing in the, in the marathons because racism. Um, but the dance marathons were these things where people would dance for hundreds, sometimes thousands of hours for cash prizes during the Great Depression. Now, the real wild thing about all this is you could dance for 1,400 hours and two minutes and you win. If you dance for 1,400 hours and one minute, you get nothing except shelter, food, a bed for however long it takes. And these marathons were rigorous. I mean, you had to one of the two of the people had to be moving at all times, right? And so the photos from them are often these things where you see people leaning on each other, one person sleeping, one person being held up by someone. Yeah, it's pretty bleak. This one is one that is especially kind of daunting. But it was this thing where, for me, I thought the idea horrified me and also fascinated me. And I fell really deep into this, like deconstructing what the motivation might be for someone to do this with another person, right? And at the time, there was no connection being made between my brain and this Soul Train essay that was still a lot of pretty language that wasn't necessarily moving in any direction. And then I did a bit of research on what I assumed was, were these two people. Look at the hours dance, that's wild. And there was something interesting to me about one fact that arose. I'm like nervously watching. This. Is this for me and Q and A, or just for me? I'm not gonna go over. I'm not gonna go over. Trust me. I feel like a funny thing is that I'm not, even though I'm now like meandering. I still promise I'm not gonna go over. A funny thing is that I don't really find think that I am competitive anymore. Like I think I've massaged all my competitiveness out of me through years of sports. Um, but I feel like if there is something where someone is like, you have to do this, then I, I just recently had to record the audiobook for the fifth anniversary edition of um, They Can't Kill Us Till They Kill Us. And I didn't really want to do it because I was like, revisiting five-year-old writing could be traumatizing, whatever. Uh, but I was like, they booked, this, they booked the recording for a week. And I was like, I don't need a week. And I said, well, and I said, I need two days. And they're like, if you only do it in two days, you have to do everything in one take and read it perfectly. And I was like, I need two days. Got it done in a day and a half. <laughs> um, these two people. Okay, so the thing with the dance marathon is if you look at the photos of them and you see the people immersed in them, you think sometimes that these folks are beloved or partners in some way or related in some way. But the thing with dance marathons was that you had to pick a person to join you based purely off of logistics. Because of the nature of it, because you had to hold people up, because you had to carry them sometimes, because you had to feed them and all of these things, the idea was that you had to pick someone who you could reasonably hold up who was not so heavy that you, know, you couldn't. They had to be able to hold you up, you had to be able to hold them up. And so people were going to these dance marathons with like, neighbors or male people in their neighborhood or the guy at the corner store, right? Because that is the person that worked for them. And through this process, there was this whole research that went into um, digging through the dance marathons. And through this process, there were people who like fell in love with each other because you are face to face with one person for 1400 hours. 
and you are the only person that other person has to rely on for 1400 hours. Now, of course, I don't want to make too much romantics out of the dread of this kind of process where people were essentially doing this to survive, to get food for a little bit and to get shelter for a little bit. Um, there's a wild history about barns that made this happen too, but we don't have the time for me to talk about barns. <laughs> and then something clicked, right? What I really want to say is, is that um, in every bit of writing that I do, I am mostly trying to figure out how to make the real movement of a piece or the real volta of a piece or the real engine of a piece is about this big for me. Maybe four to five lines, maybe a paragraph, and everything that surrounds it has to orient people to prepare for that, right? And so instead of something clicked for me because instead of this piece being about Soul Train and about Soul Train lines about Don Cornelius, I realized that it was a piece instead about devotion. In the earliest, earliest, earliest portion of the Soul Train line, the people who would meet at the top of it did not really know who they were gonna be dancing with. And so you would just arrive and there would be a person across from you and you would have to figure out movements as you went down the line. Sometimes with awful results, right? But sometimes with these really miraculous results where people would eventually, like halfway through, their bodies would just end up in sync, right? And it became this question of the romantics of endurance versus the romantics of learning someone in a small container of space and not wanting to leave it. And so in that essay, particularly, there's maybe like half a paragraph about love and about being present and about being face to face with someone in deciding for however long you have with them that that is your person, that is the person who in the case of the Soul Train line, is going to hold you up and making you look maybe a little bit less foolish. And that is a person in the case of the dance marathon who is physically going to hold you up. And um, every bit of, I don't know, I know there are certainly writers in here, and I'm always kind of asking myself, how quickly can I deliver the information that ties the story together without really forcing people to endure the kind of rhapsodic waxing that I can tend to do. Instead saying, this is the lighthouse. And you'll know it when you get to it, but you gotta float for a little while. And um, I don't know, there are some people, I, there are people in here who have maybe read that piece and understand that like the, in, the beginning of it begins with this slow, meticulous deconstruction of the dance marathon and then flows into this idea about Soul Train. But at the very end, it's like, also, this is about none of this. Writing for me and storytelling, the reason I go back to the oral tradition and to my father's storytelling and to elders, I know their storytelling, because what I, you learn through the oral tradition is how to trick people. If you only have like five good stories, but you have to tell them for a lifetime, then you learn different ways to engineer them. So you trick people into, into thinking they're hearing something they've never heard before until they realize it's the thing they've known the entire time, right? If I want to write about, it, <laughs> I just gave this long rambly talk to, not this talk, but to talk about the, 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 the three things. Writers who feel like they orbit the same topics and that there's shame in that. I never understood that. Johnny Cash made a life out of it. Johnny Cash was like, love, God, murder, that's it. That's what you're getting, you know what I mean? And that was his whole thing. He made decades off of that. And when you do that, when you say, these are the things I know I can orient people towards, the container is broad. If I know that I can write about love and desire and longing in a hundred different ways, it's the same story and I'm just telling it in a different way every time. And so I think the, the, the end result here is, um, to ask yourself, what happens at the exit point? How do you build the lighthouse? That's the real question of storytelling, I think. And then how do you build enough to get people to float towards it? I got 20 seconds left. <laughs> and that's, that was my, but I did wanna, can I watch, can we watch a Soul Train video? Okay. Um, so I'm done talking with 10 seconds to spare, but uh, I did, 
I did bring, I'm not going to watch all three, but I, I bought some, I put some Soul Train videos up because I wanted to watch an older one. Well, they're all old now, but I wanted to watch like a, I don't know, are they, okay, cool. Oh, you're doing that. I'm not, this is no longer work. I was like, am I doing that? Look at me. So this one, 